Hi, and thank you. We certainly do. We have Sheila Bear. I remember Bob Pisani back in credit crisis days used to call Sheila Bear the rock star of finance based on how many people used to crowd around her on the floor of the exchange. <laughs> Sheila, you were the former chairperson of the FDIC during one of the most tumultuous times in my lifetime, that's for sure. Right. So we wake up today and we open up the Wall Street Journal and what do we see? FDIC fund reached its 1.15% yeah. threshold, right. uh, lowest right. problem list in terms of banks in seven years. Why don't you give me not only your thoughts, but maybe show us how much uh, progress has been made, in your opinion, since those days where it seemed like you were closing an institution about every hour. Yeah, so those were challenging times. Uh, you know, when I first came to the FDIC in June of 2006, the first thing I did was to raise premiums. It was not uh, popular for banks because even then we realized we didn't have sufficient reserves to get through a cycle. And there were some legal restraints that, uh, that had prohibited us in the past from doing that. So we never, I'm very proud of the fact that we made it through the crisis never having to borrow from the Treasury Department. On a cash flow basis, we always stayed uh, cash positive. And I think it's great now that they're you know, well over 70 billion now uh, because, uh, and that's an important threshold. And they're, they're building that buffer up though. So if we ever get into another cycle, and we always get into some kind of cycle, there's plenty of uh, money to draw from. So you know, I, when I look at that threshold of 1.15%, uh, right. it, it seems low, but it isn't, is it? Or, yeah. I mean, give me your thoughts. Many would look at that and say, wow, yeah. uh, you know, that there's a lot of leverage going on there, but it really isn't yeah. about the leverage perception. No, it, it's really not. So a couple of things. So the, the equity capital of the entire bank, banking industry is there for loss absorption. So that, that stands in front of our losses. And then also people need to understand that when a bank fails, we get the assets. So it's not like we're just writing a big check, paying off insured depositors. We get the assets that we can sell off. And we typically sold those in whole bank transactions when banks failed. So it's really, it's almost working capital uh, that you need uh, in, that, in that fund. And so, it, but it is, it looks like, you know, trillions of dollars for insured deposits and only 70, 77 billion in, in, uh, in a reserve fund. It looks slow, but again, the entire capital of the banking industry is in front of the FDIC for loss absorption, and then we acquire the assets when a bank fails, which helps absorb losses as well. Now, Sheila, for those uh, watching that may be investing in banks, uh, and even right. those that may be considering uh, smaller banks, do the right. premiums that will subside and start to shrink now that these thresholds have been met, will they make a difference right. to the performance of banks, small, medium, and large? No, I, I think there's a, it, it's still, uh, it, deposit insurance is still very, very inexpensive, uh, giving the benefit that it has. So I'm glad that they're going to be able to give a little premium relief to community banks now, eventually to the larger banks once they hit to get to a higher level. But no, it's, it's not, uh, it's not uh, what I would say material in terms of a bank's profitability. Uh, and so it's, it's good news in the sense that it, it shows that the, the, the industry itself was strong enough to recapitalize the deposit insurance fund, but in terms of actually uh, relief on premiums, I don't think it's a, it's a huge driver of, of, of profitability at all. Now, finally, Sheila, in our last half minute, <laughs> mid-October, we get money market reform. Uh, yeah. We obviously are now in stronger hands. Uh, is there any issues that make you worry about the reforms? We've already seen a rather large exodus from some yeah. of the money market funds. Your final thoughts? Well, I am worried about it. I, my view was that the simplest, easiest thing is just, just remove the fiction of a stable NAV. Money market funds are mutual funds, so they, their there's value of their shares should be marked based on what the underlying assets are worth. They didn't do that. They had this complicated thing. If it's a prime institutional fund, it floats. If it's a government or retail, it doesn't float. And then I think one of the worst things they did is, is uh, put on gates and fees the ability of, of funds to impose gates and fees, which basically says, well, we're going to stop money market fund runs by denying people access to their money or making it more expensive for them to get their money. So I do, uh, I, I do worry about it. I think you're seeing a lot of movement into government funds now because they can still have this fiction of a stable nav. That's skewing resources to government financing versus private corporate financing uh, in the short-term uh, commercial paper market. So uh, I, I do uh, am concerned that this is not working as well as it might have if we just have a simple, you know, go to a floating nav and be done with it. I know, you know, simple is always best, especially Simple's when it comes always to better. regulations. That's right. Absolutely. Yes. Sheila, thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Sarah.